do just uh, do just shout up. Okay. Is that is that visible? Yes, it is. Lovely. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to give the birthday lecture this year. It's quite a feat to follow Keith Cushman and his wonderful talk on Lady Chatterley's lover last year. Thank you everyone for coming and may I also just take this opportunity to thank not just the DH Lawrence Society of Eastwood who have always been very welcoming and supportive of my early work on Lawrence, but also the DH Lawrence Society of North America and all the scholars associated with Lawrence studies worldwide who create such a lively and good hearted community. Um, it's wonderful as a fairly early career um, scholar to, to have you know, been able to enter into this, this wonderful world of Lawrence studies and, and be welcomed um, so, so broadly. So thank you very much for that. Um, always greatly appreciated. Well, thinking about my topic for this 2022 birthday lecture, I naturally thought I'd have to draw on the significance of the year 1922 in literary studies. Inevitably, the year that saw the publication of Ulysses, The Wasteland and Jacob's Room has attracted much critical attention from Michael North's study uh, Reading 1922 to Bill Goldstein's The World Broke in Two and Kevin Jackson's Constellation of Genius 1922 Modernism Year One, among other examples. Um, but it struck me that Aaron's Rod is never considered as centrally part of the picture. And perhaps with the exception of Goldstein's book, which is aimed at a broader audience, Lawrence is often mentioned just in passing. The critical consensus is that Aaron's Rod is one of Lawrence's most uneven and ill-organized books, often classed alongside Kangaroo and the Plumed Serpent as a work of the so-called leadership period, and therefore as rather unpalatable. In her study, Lawrence's leadership politics and the turn, toward, uh, turn against women, Cornelia Nixon claims that by 1917, Lawrence believed that personal salvation was to be found in submission to a male leader. This great army of manhood would march away from their women to build a new world. End quote. But the polemical writer that Lawrence is in his non-fiction, such as in Fantasia of the Unconscious, where he advocates the, the leadership idea, is not always the same writer that we find in the much more exploratory and complex fictional writing. As David Ellis observes, as, as Aaron's Rod and Kangaroo show, there were times when Lawrence understood very well the pitfalls of the leader-follower relationship and how, when it's badly managed by the dominant party, leaders will get the followers that they deserve. And certainly, if the leader in Aaron's Rod is inferred to be Rod and Lily, then we're shown how faulty such a leader is, I think. By giving us access to Lily's consciousness and to the contradictions in many of the statements he makes, we're gradually able to see his authority through Aaron's eyes debunked. And by this, we're able to question the folly of placing our faith in one individual. And far from marching away from their women, both men come to realize that their ties to their wives, Tanny, a Frida figure, and Lottie are indissoluble. Well, Lawrence considered Aaron's Rod the last of his serious English novels, the end of the rainbow women in love line. The novel right, might be read differently if we instead see it as a culmination of a trilogy, even if it does seem quite retrograde alongside those two great novels. So I'll briefly provide some context on Lawrence's writing of the novel before we go on to examine more closely his oft-employed pseudo-couple device, as Tony Pinkney calls it, in which the depictions of Aaron and Lily enabled him to write startlingly self-critically, and perhaps with a more candid insight into his own contradict contradictory nature and desires than he'd been able to articulate before. I'd also like to consider one reader's special relationship to the book and its author at a time when Lawrence set about interrogating what male friendship meant to him. 
And as he fantasized about reimagining or um, querying the conventional script of the nuclear family and kinship ties, a project that had increased in intensity since, since the rainbow as Lawrence became ever more radical and oppositional to the traditions of the English novel and its insistence on the marriage plot. Aaron's Rod might also be more productively appreciated as a book of the immediate post-war period. It opens at Christmas uh, 1918. Quote, the war was over and there was a sense of relief that was almost a new menace. A man felt the violence of the, ni of the nightmare released now into the general air. So just as Lawrence considered that in Women in Love, the bitterness of the war can be taken for granted in the characters. War trauma is felt everywhere in Aaron's Rod, sometimes overtly, um, or other times, as in Wolfe's novels, the violence is depicted obliquely. It's kind of a subdued or subconscious fight, always promising to rise to the surface. Freud's image of human society ruled by unconscious drives and instincts, both impressed and distressed writers like Wolf. While Lawrence disagreed with Freudianism, perceiving that by the 1920s, it had become a public danger. He writes that, quote, the mob was on the alert. The Oedipus complex was a household word. The incest motive became a commonplace of tea table chat amateur analysis became the vogue. As ever, Lawrence rapidly assimilated the most pressing and cultural, cultural and intellectual concerns of his time and really hit the zeitgeist with his popular psychoanalytical works, Psychoanalysis of the Unconscious and Fantasia of the, the Unconscious, published in 1921 and 1922 respectively. And in his 2020 study, D.H. Lawrence and Psychoanalysis, John, T John Turner describes Aaron's Rod as Lawrence's most psychoanalytically engaged novel. Turner contextualizes Lawrence's astute understanding of what was known as hysteria and examines his interactions with Dr. David Eder, one of the first British psychoanalysts, whom Lawrence had earlier read in The New Age. And Michael North describes how in the early 1920s, quote, the enthusiasm for things psychological was so extreme, both in the United States and Great Britain, that it might quite reason reasonably have seemed a psychological symptom itself. In both countries, there seemed to be a generalized anxiety about anxiety, which produced a number of odd how-to books like Outwitting Our Nerves, subtitled A Primer of Psychotherapy, with advice on how to free yourself from the shackles of repressed instincts. And a host of products like Gen Aspirin, which promised to control stage fright and other forms of nervousness alongside uh, relieving colds and headaches. So a kind of general, um, general aspirin, a uh, catch-all kind of uh, tablet that you, that you could take. One of Lawrence's own re remedies, of course, for treating the jangling nerves of modernity was to take flight, and he gives this um, characteristic to both of his protagonists. And Lawrence spends 1922 in almost perpetual transit, we, as we know, leaving Europe for New Mexico at the invitation of, of Mabel Dodge, who was herself analysed by the prominent psycho psychoanalyst A. A. Brill but delaying his journey there by going via Ceylon, joining the Brewsters and Australia. Leaving Europe was a wrench for him. During the previous year, he considered the move to be psychologically symbolic, commenting, this is a sort of crisis for me. I've got to come unstuck from the old life in Europe and I can't know beforehand, so have patience. Aaron's Rod was composed in fits and starts, which is suggestive of the way in which its author was in crisis mode, kind of feeling his way towards a new philosophy, but he didn't know quite what that was to look like. He began the novel in autumn 1917 in the Mecklenburg Square days, when he was where he was living in London after having been thrown out of Cornwall in October, which just reinforced his sense that he and his books were under persecution. He felt that he should never forgive England their treatment of the rainbow. 
At first, he conceived Aaron's Rod to be a comic novel and as blameless as Cranford, he says. It was to be one of the books publishers could accept without fear of prosecution, since Lawrence was in desperate need of money. In February 1918, he'd had exactly um, six pounds, 19 shillings in the world. He didn't want his new book to be, as he put it, hawked around and serialized in English magazines, but the American periodical The Dial, which had a good reputation for, for publishing modernist texts, could be better trusted. And he'd begun to, to look to America for a more appreciative readership. Aaron's Rod was finally finished at the end of May, May 1921, when the Lawrences were in Baden-Baden. Lawrence stayed in the village of Eber Steinberg and managed to write at speed in the Black Forest. But by then, the manuscript was radically different and contained censorious material, such as the descriptions of Aaron having sex with the Marchesa in Florence. These were scenes that he found he really couldn't alter, even for Seltzer, an advanced New York publisher whom he wished to please. He told his Buddhist friends, the Brewsters, that they wouldn't like Aaron at all. Instead of bringing him nearer to heaven in leaps and bounds, he's misbehaving and putting ten figure, fingers to his nose at everything. Damn heaven, damn holiness, damn nirvana, damn it all. He acknowledged that it was a queer book and that nobody would know what to make of it, but he said, it's what I mean for the moment. Back in December 1918, writing to Catherine Mansfield, he conceived a, a new purpose for his novel writing. Um, quote, it seems to me if one is to do fiction now, one must thresh, uh, cross the threshold of the human psyche. And I'll, report, I'll return to this important letter shortly. Lawrence noted that everybody hated Aaron's Rod, even Frieda, which is kind of not surprising. <laughs> but that's not strictly true, because one reader believed it to be Lawrence's best novel and finds it to be of a piece with Fantasia. Lawrence ratified this view, reportedly commenting, I think you understand Fantasia and Aaron all right. That reader also found it to be an expression of his own close relationship with the author. And so enamoured was he with Lawrence's messages in these two books that he claimed to have founded the Adelphi, pointedly using the Greek word for brotherhood in 1923 on the strength of offering Lawrence a vehicle for further similar publications. And that reader is, of course, John Middleton Murray, the Judas figure who, who betrayed Lawrence. Murray's reminiscences of D.H. Lawrence first published in 1933 in part reprints pieces Murray had written and published in the Adelphi between June 1930 and March 1931. It outlines the nature of their bond and their falling out. It's inevitably a partial and very distorted account as all memoirs are, uh, though it seems to be less central which has been roundly publication for its portrayal of a de degenerate Lawrence morbidly fearful of sex at the time Lawrence uh, at the time Murray wrote the memoir um, he'd become parodically Laurentian having taken upon himself um, the role uh, sorry, I just lost where I am. The role of the ex the public exponent of a sex sexually fulfilled marriage. So I'll just say that again. At the time Murray wrote the memoir, he'd become parodically Laurentian, having taken upon himself the role of the public exponent of a sexually fulfilled marriage. And this inevitably skews his critical readings. But I think the chapter on Aaron's Rod in Son of Woman is at least slightly less spiteful um, than, than some of the rest of the book. And I do wonder whether the damage, Lawrence, uh, damage Murray attempted to do to Lawrence in this memoir has led us kind of in, in some disgust away from giving credence to, to Murray's relationship to Aaron's Rod, which hasn't really received a great deal of, of critical attention. But Murray was the closest male friend Lawrence had during his lifetime, and he does allow us a closer biographical insight into the ways Lawrence understood and remade aspects of their relationship in fictional form, and the ways in which Lawrence positioned Murray for a time as the best contender for an ideal type of male friendship that Lawrence sought, but also resisted. 
So rereading the novel, I reflected on the contradiction that while Lawrence so often preached the importance of blood bruderschaft, uh, manifested most famously, of course, in the relationship between Birkin and, Birkin and Gerald, partially another Lawrence Murray pseudo couple, but also in Ben Cooley and uh, Summers in Kangaroo and Ramon and Cipriano in The Plume Serpent. Um, but he always struggled to, to maintain close friendships or bonds with men. And this is something that he was all too aware of. And he writes of it in that fascinating letter to Catherine Mansfield on the 5th of December, 1918. He begins, I want to write a few little things I have on my mind. He'd been reading Kateliansky's copy of Young and sends it to Jack. Um, to, to Murray, warning that this mother incest idea can become an ob obsession. But it seems to me that there's this much truth in it, that at certain periods, the man has a desire and a tendency to return unto the woman, to make her his goal and end, find his justification in her. It seems to me um, it is what Jack does to you and what, what repels and fascinates you. I've done it and now struggle all my might to get out. In a way, Frida is the devouring mother. I do think a woman must yield some sort of precedence to a man and he must take this precedence. Consequently, the woman must follow as it were unquestioning. I can't help it, I believe this. Frida doesn't, hence our fight. Secondly, I do believe in friendship. I believe tremendously in friendship between a man and a man, a pledging of men to each other inviolably. But I have not ever met or formed such friendship. Also, I believe the same way in friendship between men and women and between women and women. Sworn, pledged, eternal, as eternal as the marriage bond and as deep, but I have not met or formed such friendship. Excuse this sudden burst into dogma. Please give the letter to Jack. I say it to him particularly. So this repetition of but I have not met or formed such friendship is, is carefully and pointedly made to invite Mansfield's sympathy. It sounds like it's a form of friendship that society as it conventionally was would not recognise or that people might not understand or that it was a kind of ide idealisation that Lawrence couldn't realise couldn't, um, realis and might not permit himself to form if ever he did find it. Mansfield asked specifically to share the, the letter with Murray, whom I think he's, he's really addressing in, in this letter. It's an intimate appeal of the sort that earlier in, early in their friendship, Mansfield and Murray were amenable to. They recognised Lawrence had a great need of such a bond and came to Cornwall at the Lawrence's, uh, as the Lawrence's neighbours at his request, and reluctantly, since they were happily settled um, in Bandol. The letter also gives us a sense of what it would have been like to be the kind of friend Lawrence deeply wanted. Friendship in being akin to the marriage bond looks a little bit more like possessiveness, perhaps born of a fear of loss or a lack of precedence. It might remind us of the way he for a long time resented Frida's attachment to her children. He wrote to Murray in 1923, quote, wrong or not, I can't stomach the chasing of those weakly children. Similar sentiments are expressed by Lily in the novel, who tries to persuade Aaron that when a woman has children, quote, she thinks the whole world wags only for them and her. John Turner makes the fascinating point that not weakly, but Otto Gross was the, quote, ghostly third in Lawrence and Frieda's marriage, who periodically required exorcism. Lawrence had originally subscribed to Gross's idea of Frieda as the woman of the future, as in his depiction of, of Anna and Ursula Brangwyn. But Aronsrod explores the consequences for men, uh, for relationships of modern woman's realization of such a power. And I think at, at the risk of undertaking the kind of amateur analysis that, that Lawrence warned of, there are plentiful second best anxieties in Lawrence's work, not least in the early story of, of that title. Yet in other ways, an inviolable attachment was against what he professed to believe in. Because in, in Fantasia, he writes about the importance of developing a, quote, pure individual being and of learning, quote, to live from the center of our own responsibility only. But 
Lawrence explains, you can't reach this goal of pure individual being by the rupture of all ties. And the characterization of Lily is in part Lawrence's blistering self-examination of how much he asked of others. Aaron tells him, everybody's got to agree with you, that's your price. Lily dwells on this revelation and comes to Aaron's bedside that night saying in a hard voice, I'm not going to pretend to have friends on the face of things, no, and I don't have friends who don't fundamentally agree with me. A friend means one who is, is at, at one with me in matters of life and death. And if you're at one with all the rest, then you're their friend. So be their friend and please leave me in the morning. You owe me nothing. You have nothing more to do with me. So it's either all or nothing and Lily calls the shots. Aaron in response knew quite well that Lily had made a certain call on his, Aaron's soul, a call which he, Aaron, did not at all intend to obey. Well, let it be quits. But it isn't quits, it's, it's only the beginning. Aaron returns to the Midlands to see how his wife is getting along without him. And during their confrontation, he realizes that he still feels like the, quote, fascinated victim of his wife, whose appeal for him to, to admit he was wrong in leaving her, quote, seemed to him like the swaying of a serpent which mesmerizes the fated, fluttering, helpless bird. Lawrence's use of the word fascinates also appears in that letter to Mansfield when Lawrence was telling of her of the way that she both repelled and fa uh, was both repelled and fascinated by Murray's subordination to her. Frida, like Mansfield, like Lottie and Tanny, is the devouring mother from whose apparent absorption Lawrence has to struggle all my might to get out. And, and Judith Rudman's influential 1984 study, D.H. Lawrence and the Devouring Mother, provides a compelling discussion of the ways in which Lawrence looked to patriarchal hierarchy as a form of self-defense to, to protect his threatened masculinity. Aaron is a version of how Lawrence saw himself and, and Murray, and by extension, uh, most of their generation in getting free from modern love, which he feared was inseparable from power and merger with the other. Aaron realizes that, quote, love was a battle in which each party strove for the mastery of each other's soul. So far, men, uh, man had yielded the mastery to woman. Now he was fighting for it back again and too late for the woman would never yield. As Birkin says to Gerald, you've got to take down the love and marriage ideal from its pedestal. We want something broader. I believe in the additional perfect relationship between man and man, additional to marriage. Ursula denies the possibility of such a union and Tani blindly and persistently opposes Lily's attempts to make her submit to him. But rather than blindness, Lawrence's women know what their partners are up to and aren't willing to concede. While women in love held star equilibrium between couples as the highest form of achievement, Aaron's Rod advocates pure division and perfected singleness. Singleness conveniently affords the married greater autonomy. Unlike Siegmund in The Trespasser, another of Lawrence's dissatisfied musicians, Aaron doesn't leave his family for another woman. Although he has sex with his new acquaintances, Josephine Ford and the Marchesa, these experiments have disastrous consequences since the boundaries he's attempted to police between self and other are, are breached. And it's sex with Josephine that leads psychosomatically to Aaron's influenza. He tells Lily, quote, I did myself in when I went with another woman. I felt myself go as if the bile broke inside me and I was sick. And after sex with the, quote, clinging Marchesa, which simply blighted him, he's robbed in the street by pickpockets and thus dispossessed twice over. Anton Skrebensky's moonlit sexual experience with Ursula is no less traumatic. Quote, it was like putting his face into some awful death. 
And so despite his reputation in the popular imagination as the champion of sexual liberation, as, as David Ellis has argued, sex for Lawrence's characters is sometimes abject in a Christavan powers of horror sense. There are plenty of misogynistic comments in this novel, um, prompted mainly by the miseries of marriage and a new relegation of women to the sidelines. But such comments are, are made by deeply flawed male characters egging one another on to create an alternative space for men. Aaron is depicted as a highly sensitive character, vulnerable to external influence, who suffers from, a, quote, a secret malady, the black dog of depression. And this was a condition that Lawrence knew well. John Wyther dates Lawrence's deepening sense of depression to as early as 1914. Um, when Lawrence's, quote, old capacity for detachment and distance had, during the years of the war, hardened into a kind of solitary withholding that at times came close to solipsism. Murray recalled how Lawrence could often be wistful, tremulous, tender, but the mood never lasted long. And while they were living in adjacent cottages in Higher Tregurthen, he and Mansfield would be perplexed to overhear a terrified Lawrence shouting out, Jack is killing me. So while Lawrence wanted a man with whom to be close, he began to feel threatened by the proximity. And Aaron too experiences this strained, unacknowledged opposition to his surroundings, a hard core of irrational, exhausting withholding of himself. Even in the midst of his best music, it sat in the middle of him, this invisible black dog and growled and waited never to be cajoled. Of course, he wanted to let himself go, but at the very thought, the black dog showed its teeth. And so Aaron flees from his wife a second time, wordlessly, in one black, unconscious movement. He retreats behind his black dog as a means of withholding himself, once again passively subject to forces he suspects are greater than he is. Aaron chooses Florence because it's, quote, a town of men. Looking at the statue of Michelangelo's David in the piazza, a startling realization of the robust male body beautiful, as distinct from the mangled bodies of soldiers viscerally described earlier by Sir William, reminds Aaron that, quote, here men had been at their intensest, most naked pitch here at the end of the old world and the beginning of the new. Since then, always rather puling and apologetic. He gets on a tram to Settignano and sits among the cypress trees to experience the restorative powers of nature. And it might remind us of today's mindfulness vogue of Shinrin Yoku or forest bathing, which emerged in Japan in the 1980s as, as a psychological and physiological exercise or a form of ecotherapy. Inevitably, we'll also be reminded of Birkin's need to lie naked in the long grass after Hermione hits him on the head with a lapis lazuli paperweight. Birkin also, quote, moving in a sort of darkness can only be satisfied by this coolness and subtlety of veget vegetation traveling into one's blood. And this is taking herbal medicine to another level that the, the corporeal is organically restored by the vegetal. Aaron's experience is needfully less physical and more spiritual as he perceives that never had any trees seemed so like ghosts, like soft, strange, pregnant presences. He lay and watched tall cypresses breathing and communicating, faintly moving and, as it were, walking in the small wind. And his soul seemed to leave him and go far away, far back, perhaps, to where life was all different and time passed otherwise than time passes now. As in clairvoyance, he perceived it, that our life is only a fragment of the shell of life. Much that is life has passed away from man, leaving us all mere bits. In the dark, mindful silence and inflection of the cypress trees, lost races, lost language, lost human ways of feeling and, and of knowing, the cypresses commemorate. 
leaving us all mere bits. This is one of those oblique references to collective post-war trauma, which would manifest like a bruise in Lady Chatterley's lover, in which Clifford is shipped over to England more or less in bits. It's in such passages as these that we gain a more sympathetic perspective of Aaron, even if his vision of communing trees seems a little bit contrived. Here, a man who was formerly unable to articulate his reasons for leaving his wife is presented as an amateur eco-ethnographer. So this is some productive forest bathing. Um, his, his immediate bodily sensuality is rebalanced by a spiritual commune with the eternal natural world, lost ways. Lost, lost, uh, lost races, lost ways of knowing. Lawrence's poem, Cypresses, provides a, a similar message. But despite Aaron's resolution to pursue life single, not double, he repeatedly seeks Lily out, quote, like a fate which he resented, yet which steadied him. And the conversations between Lily and Aaron seem to be um, often a, a fascinating working out of what of what Lawrence himself was thinking at this time and the contradictions that dogged him. In, in a passage which might remind us of Will Brangwyn's dependence on Anna, quote, if she were taken away, he would collapse as a house from which the central pillar is removed. Aaron says, but I can't stand by myself in the middle of the world, in the middle of people, and know I am quite by myself with nowhere to go, nothing to hold on to. I can for a day or two, but then it becomes unbearable as well. You get frightened. You feel you might go funny, as if you stood on this balcony wall with all the space beneath you. Lily, who has recently been psychoanalyzed in Munich and is therefore rather sure of his own pronouncements, replies, can't one live with one's wife and be fond of her and one's friends and enjoy their company and with the world and everything pleasantly and yet know that one is alone, essentially at the very core of me alone, eternally alone and choosing to be alone, not sentimental or lonely, but uh, alone, choosing to be alone because by one's own uh, nature, one is alone. The being with another person is secondary lots of repetition of, of alone there. Um, Lily attempts to redraw the lines of what marriage might be, with partners not owning or depending on one another, but retaining their individuality. This allows them to step in and out of the marriage when, when they please. Yet despite such a pronouncement, his need for his wife and for a friend who is at one with me means there are often incongruities in what he says. And if we, re if we read the novel closely, we can trace the contradictions in Lily's self-portrayal, uh, self sometimes as mindful Buddhist philosopher, as he, he that kind of seems to be in this, in this quotation, or, or baffled therapist, as Turner calls him, um, other times as really hungry, for predominance. Lily professes to hate bullying, but he's insidiously doctrinaire in his attempts to coerce Aaron into believing his own point of view, especially when it comes to decrying women. It's okay for Lily to retain his wife, but Aaron is compelled not to in order that um, he should follow Lily. And here we come to the famous massage scene um, in, a, in a flat near Covent Garden, which is adapted from an occasion when Lawrence nursed Murray back to health in Greatham, Sussex, in February 1915, after Murray had lost the, quote, intense affection of a man he named D. D is Gordon Campbell, whom Murray fictionalises as Dennis in his 1916 novel Still Life. His emotional wounding, as Murray describes it, also occasioned a dangerous bout of influenza, which Lawrence ministered to. Murray reports that Lawrence was, quote, in his element looking after someone, especially someone rather stupid about his body. 
there's no written evidence in Murray's journals or memoirs that the actual massage happened in real life. But as Lawrence recreates this scene, ensuring that Aaron's illness is occasioned by his emotional upset over intimacy with a woman rather than a man, he makes evident Lily's will to power over Aaron. He rubbed every speck of the man's lower body, the abdomen, the buttocks, the thighs and knees, down to the feet, rubbed it all warm and glowing with camphorated oil. He thought to himself, I wonder why I do it. I wonder why I bother with him. As soon as this man's really better, he'll punch me in the wind, metaphorically, if not actually, for having interfered with him. And Tani would say he was quite right to do it. She says, I want power over them. What if I do? Why can't they submit to a bit of healthy individual authority? The fool would die without me. In reminiscences, Murray records that from that time onwards, whatever capacity I possessed for affection towards a man was turned towards Lawrence himself. That, I suppose, was what he wanted. Well, Lawrence both did and did not want such a transferal. His letters to Campbell from March 1915 show that he went on to intervene in the Murray-Campbell relationship, covertly suggesting that Murray is to come under his aegis instead. And he writes to Campbell about forming a league of people, quote, Murray and you, Campbell, and perhaps E.M. Forster, who could help him to, quote, understand the things I can't understand by myself. He writes... There are very few people whom I need extremely because very few could help. Now, this seems to be, to me, to be sort of a, a sort of queering of traditional family structures. So Lawrence repeatedly expresses the desire to create non-biological and non-normative forms of private nuclear kinship with himself at the centre. But these are fantasies. Lawrence doesn't really make concrete plans to carry out such modes of living, lacking friends that were truly committed. Dorothy Brett would be the only one of his friends to take up this offer um, posed in, in the Café Royal in, in uh, December 1923 of communal living in New Mexico. Lawrence may have felt somewhat exposed by revealing such a fantasy as he expresses to Campbell, hence the ambiguous and coded nature of his letter in seeking what he calls a, a social revolution. Murray recalls that Lawrence wanted me to swear to be his blood brother. I said, I thought I was his blood brother. If I love you and you know I love you, isn't that enough? No, it was not enough. There ought to be some mingling of our bloods that neither of us could go back on it. I was half frightened, half repelled, and I suppose my shrinking away was manifest. He suddenly turned on me with fury. I hate your love. I hate it. You're an obscene bug sucking my life away. Now it's Murray rather than Lawrence using the word repelled. It appears that Murray's perceptible moment of vacillation revealed his resistance to Lawrence's pact-like approach. And Lawrence's fear of rejection made him react with animosity. And he would likely have noted the emptiness of Murray's declaration of love for him. But maybe from Murray's perspective, how could Lawrence ask him to be his blood brother if he really found him obscene and parasitical? Just as in marriage, equal fraternity would prove difficult to achieve in practice. And there's perhaps an acknowledgement of this in Lily's reflection on Tani's comment that he sought power over those he, he became close to. Eve Sedgwick famously theorised that homose homosocial desire may also, quote, be characterised by intense homophobia. And the Prussian officer story of 1914 shows just how deeply Lawrence intuited the proximity between same-sex desire and violent homophobia. And this, this kind of homosexual panic, a term that had recently been coined by American psychiatrist Edward J. Kempf in 1920 for a condition of panic due to the pressure of uncontrollable, perverse um, sexual cravings, as, as Kempf put it, perhaps suggest both, um, suggest both Mar L Murray and Lawrence's mutual recoil, as well as Lily's scornful reflections on the fool Aaron and his sense that Aaron would punch him for having interfered with him. 
inter interfered with him. Incidentally, in uh, January 1920, after Lawrence called Murray a dirty little worm because he'd rejected articles he hoped Murray would publish in, in the Athenaeum, Murray wrote, wrote to Lawrence threatening to hit him. He then wrote to Mansfield that Lawrence was a reptile who had slavered over him. Now, it's difficult to imagine Lawrence slavering over anybody or anything, um, but the word um, perhaps suggests that Murray perceived Lawrence's approach to him to be suspiciously homosexual. Murray's reading of Aaron's rod is that, quote, Lily wants a homosexual relation with Aaron to complete his incomplete heterosexual relation with Tanny. This is what he calls extending marriage. We should, though, resist such a reductive reading, since Lawrence conceived of, sexu of sexuality as shifting and nebulous, and his fantasy of communal living or a more open conception of marriage didn't necessarily extend to the inclusion of multiple sexual partners. And the appeal for Lawrence and Murray, to Murray towards one another was intellectual and spiritual rather than sexual. This is um, Mark Kincaid Weeks's uh, conclusion too. But um, however, both were conscious enough of and troubled by that, uh, their own and each other's attraction to men to make them look at one another askance and hit back with threats of violence or diminutive name calling. Um, worms and reptiles are cold blooded creatures, hence there could be no warm or exalted blood brotherhood here. Now, as I've been looking at this uh, more, more recently, um, and I've not got too much time to, to kind of develop this, but I, I wondered whether Lawrence's desire for male friendship in this period is, is more akin um, to, to Whitman's Calamus uh, poems that envisage a new political order rooted in comradeship. Um, might the notion of comradeship as Lawrence understood it be a radical queer revisioning of kinship ties, the kind of social revolution that Lawrence was feeling for? If so, it remains a fantasy. Um, Lawrence doesn't fully allow it. And I think this tension is driven by his love and loyalty to Frida, his capacity for withholding himself, and also perhaps his resistance to fully acknowledging the nature of his attraction to men. Towards the end of the novel, Aaron feverish, feverishly writes a letter, a therapeutic act in which he confides, I believe in the fight of love, even if it blinds me. And if it's a question of the world, I believe in fighting it and having it hate me, even if it breaks my legs. I want the world to hate me because I can't bear the thought it might love me. Aaron's outburst seems revelatory about feelings that energize the passionate side to Lawrence, the combative outsider, the rebel, the priest of love. Just after Aaron's emotive outburst, the, the narrator interjects, when a man writes a letter to himself, it's a pity to post it to someone else. Perhaps the same is true of a book. So in his depiction of Aaron and Lily, I think Lawrence seems to have created a split self, two versions of some of the contradictory aspects of behaviours and tendencies he viewed in himself. Um, uh, I'm not the first to think this. Murray, Murray also comes to that conclusion, and 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 Kincaid Weeks also um, also suggests that there's much um, of Aaron in uh, in Lawrence. Um, by the end of the no novel, uh, Lily counsels Aaron on remedying man's essential isolation. You can't lose yourself neither in woman nor humanity nor in God. You've always got yourself on your hands in the end and a very raw and jaded and humiliated and nervous neurasthenic self it is too in the end. There inside you lies your own very self like a germinating egg. You've got to develop it from the egg into the chicken into the one and only phoenix. You can only stick to your very own self and never betray it, unfold your own destiny. On the slide, I've also added a plate that Murray reproduces in Sons of a Son of Woman, in which Lawrence appears to counsel Murray in a similar way, writing to the old raven in the act of becoming a young phoenix. 
um, that was a, a stamp he, he kind of gave to him in, in Christmas, at Christmas 1923. A nervous neurasthenic self. We're back to where we started with Jen Aspirin, the 1920s nerve pills. Aaron has come a long way from being unable to articulate himself in words to writing a letter in which he states his belief in the fight of love and um, finally coming to question Lily's character. Aaron had been through it all. He said he'd started by thinking Lily a peculiar little freak, gone on to think him a wonderful chap and a bit pathetic progressed and found him generous but overbearing, then cruel and intolerant, allowing no man to have a soul of his own, then terribly arrogant, throwing a fellow aside like an old glove which is in holes at the finger ends. And all the time which was most beastly, seeing through one, all the time freak and outsider as he was, Lily knew, he knew and his soul was against the whole world. Lawrence then revealed that he knew how Murray and others viewed him because it was in a sense how Lawrence viewed himself. Um, on the one hand, I want the world to hate me because I can't bear the thought that it might love me. On the other hand, you can only stick to your own very self and never betray it. So one impulse was, was for him to care very deeply about, the what, about what the world thought of him, but another didn't care one bit. Lawrence breaks from idealist notions of the realized self derived from 19th century humanism and from the Bildungsroman tradition, for it is, in a sense, a kind of patchy spiritual education that Aaron undergoes in his dealings with Lily, and explores alternative means of dealing with the intrusive, conflict-ridden conditions of modern life and a new post-Freudian self-consciousness. Reviewing Aaron's Rod in The Nation and Athenaeum on 12th of August 1922, Murray asserted that it's the most important thing that has happened to English literature since the war. To my mind, it's much more important than Ulysses. No doubt it's a smaller thing, but Ulysses is sterile. Aaron's Rod is full of the sap of life. Aaron's Rod shows that he has gained the one thing he lacked, serenity. Mr. Lawrence can now laugh at himself without surrendering a jot of his belief in the truth he proclaims. It's as though he looked back whimsically at his own struggling figure in the past, saw all his violence and extravagance, and recognized that he could not have become what he is um, if he had not been what he was. While I doubt anyone would say that Aaron's rod is more important than Ulysses, um, we can maybe talk about that short, shortly. Um, I think Murray's right in what he says about Lawrence's critical self-reflection, which was at once satirical, but also kind of made in earnest. So in, in my brief abstract for this lecture, I suggested that we might reappraise Aaron's Rod in the centenary year of its publication. Now, reappraise might be too optimistic a word. In 2022, and with the benefit of retrospect, we might still treat this novel with some caution, recognising the chauvinistic suggestion that a social hierarchy which affords submission to a male leader is a dangerous precedent for some of the challenges we're still facing today. However, Lawrence is by no means confident in, in this assertion. We've, when we've seen him reflect candidly that some of his own ideas as professed by Lily would be judged as cranky, um, that people viewed him as a, as a freak and an outsider. Um, Aaron's rod might therefore be more significant as, as a shedding of his own perceived sicknesses um, rather than a novel of ideas intended to have broader social influence. Um, again, I'd, I'd like your kind of ideas, uh, ideas on that. Um, but I hope it doesn't sound too pat to suggest that we might also appreciate Aaron's Rod as a novel interesting to us in the 2020s in the midst of another anxiety epidemic that perhaps allows us to better comprehend the states of minds uh, of these troubled characters as they seek to assess how to live 
restrict, uh, resisting restrictive uh, social norms and conventions, and also considering what kind of, of love or familial ties are possible. And so it's perhaps at the intersection of mental health studies and queer studies that this novel might be most appreciably reconsidered in the 21st century. Okay, <laughs> finished quite a lot earlier than I, than I um, expected. I think I've probably spoke, spoken too quickly there, but um, at least we'll have plenty of time uh, for, for questions. Thank you very much.